from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's word. The inward look, the outward look, the upward look from the old, old book. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's Word. There is a fresh copy of Friday Church News from Brother Cloud on the bulletin board. And so if you want to be caught up with the latest in Christianity from a warning perspective, warning against sin and apostasy, make sure you take some time to look those notes over. By way of announcement, it is a very busy season at Cornerstone Baptist Church. We are leaving for camp in the morning. At 7 o'clock in the morning, we will pull out uh, with 15 crazy campers excited about the week ahead. And I'm excited about the week ahead. Won't, won't you pray for us uh, that us counselors can survive and uh, survive everything we're about to head into um, it is quite an interesting thing going five hours away for five days with a bunch of kids that are just excited. But more than anything, I'm praying that God would use the preaching, and that's how I'm asking you to pray. Pray for safety, but pray that God uses the preaching of his word throughout the week to touch the hearts of these young people. Um, do pray. Make that a serious, serious, serious matter of prayer uh, this week. There's a lot to be done. Uh, we need some volunteers in between uh, services uh, after the morning service to help put together some uh, sack lunches, some sandwiches and things. Um, if you can help with that, please do. Of course, I have a meeting with all campers and parents. It is absolutely positively mandatory. Uh, counselors as well. And then I have a separate meeting with counselors after that uh, to go through some procedures for uh, being a camp counselor. So do pray that the Lord would bless. I am genuinely excited with everything going on, uh, the busyness. Um, I'm glad that we can take these kids away out of their element. Very important for young people to be removed at times from their comfort zone and to be put in a different atmosphere and be immersed in the word of God. Good decisions are made at Bible camp. I believe in Bible camp. Uh, there won't be a summer that goes by that my kids won't be in Bible camp. Not a summer. I just believe in it. They need it. And um, I'm praying that the Lord would use it especially this year. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We're studying the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. A part of our greater study of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the miracle we're studying now is the healing of the man with the withered hand. The healing of the man with the withered hand. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We'll read verses 9 through 14. Matthew 12, verse number 9. The Bible says, and when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. Then saith he to the man, don't miss this command, stand forth, stretch forth, I'm sorry, stretch forth thine hand. That's a very important command. Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. Again, notice the command in verse 13, stretch forth thine hand. Go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Many things compete for our attention when we're reading the word of God. 
happen to believe that in this day of technology uh, and our use of technology that we have been weaned away from having the attention span that's needed for serious Bible reading and Bible study. Everything's a short sound bite. Everything is competing for our attention, the videos and the different things. And it takes work, real work, to say I'm going to concentrate on my Bible reading and get something out of it. Let's do that in Sunday school this morning. Mark chapter 3, verse number 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. There's another command. Don't miss that one um, as well. Stand forth. By the way, this is the only gospel uh, recording this story where this command, stand forth, is given along with, with, with stretch your hand out. Verse number four. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, we see the Lord there exercising anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. There's that command again. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. And then Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse number 6. Luke 6, verse number 6. And it came to pass on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can study the Bible. We pray that you would give us uh, truth that we can apply to our lives. Lord, not just head knowledge, but life knowledge knowledge that we can use uh, throughout our lives to honor you in a greater way. May these miracles stand as a reminder that you are the God of miracles, that you've not forgotten how to perform them, and that you want to work in our lives as we follow you. Give us also comfort through the scriptures. Build us up, Lord. Edify your people. And I pray that we would leave today knowing that we heard from your word. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we know that the Pharisees here did everything they could to hinder the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We spoke of the hindrance last week, and we spoke of how Christ answered them. They came to him with a hindrance. Uh, is it okay to do this on the Sabbath day? And the Lord Jesus Christ, they wanted to stump him. We mentioned that. But they could not stump the Lord. He gave them an answer. And we see that there is an example in the answer. If we go back to Matthew's account, go back to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 11. The Bible says, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. The Lord Jesus Christ exposed the hypocrisy of these hinderers by telling them that if a sheep 
was in a bad way on the Sabbath day, what would you do? Would you not help it? And he used that to show them that a man is much better than a sheep. Why would we not do well to another man? Healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day was more important than rescuing a sheep from the pit. But the Pharisees, if they were honest, would say, yes, we would rescue the sheep, but you shouldn't heal the man. Look at how their priorities were messed up. Why should they be against healing a man when they are for rescuing an animal? Think about that mindset. Think about that mentality. That mentality is still alive today. Only we call it animal rights. We say save the spotted owl, but kill the babies in the abortion clinic. We do the exact same thing. We noted that this, uh, in, in a previous study, that this problem of giving honor to animals uh, more than humans is a problem that is plaguing our society today. Christ rejectors give more homage, give more respect to animals than they do humans. Now think about that. The animal rights movement is alive today. It is a movement of enlightenment, is what they say. But it's really the enemy of God when we exalt the creature above the creator. And it reveals how great this enmity against the Lord Jesus Christ, how great it is even in our land, that we give more thought to animals than we do to man. I want us to look at the effect of Christ's answer. Look at the effect in Mark chapter 3. Mark 3, verse number 4. Mark 3, 4, and he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? Now, how do they respond to that? The Bible says they were stumped. It says, but they held their peace. They were silenced. He silenced them. I think they were embarrassed. I think they deserved to be embarrassed. He confounded them, whose mouths must be stopped, the Bible teaches later in the New Testament. And so the Pharisees kept quiet. And the original language seems to bear that it was a quiet that they maintained. In other words, they weren't just silence in a, in a quick and, and, and passing sense, but they were quiet and they had to keep on being quiet. They had nothing to say. They had no words for this. I'm reminded that Christ can silence anyone very quickly. He can silence the sinner very fast. We have many people who can give clever uh, reasons for why they do evil. They can give clever reasons for why they oppose the truth. But at the judgment bar of God, all of those clever arguments aren't going to mean uh, a hill of beans. Those clever arguments will do nothing when we stand before God in complete silence as we stand before him with whom we have to do. You can't fool God by your craftiness. You can fool man, but God sees right through us, doesn't he? He sees right through us. It's easy to want to put on a persona. It, it really is. It's easy to want to put our, our best foot forward. It's easy to want to appear better than we are. We come to church in our Sunday's best. But God knows the real us. And man has an amazing ability to portray himself as something other than what he really is. By the way, that's why I like being around transparent people. I like being around people, what you see is what you get. You may not always like it. You may not always agree with it, but they're not putting on airs. What you see is what you get. Judgment time will emphasize the fact that we can't fool God. I want us to look next at the anger about the hindrance. And if you can 
bear with me this study of the miracles when we take the different passages of the same account we are literally merging those three gospels together and studying this miracle very very analytically very very closely uh, look at the anger of Christ in Mark chapter 3 verse number 5 Mark 3 5 and when he had looked round about on them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Mark is the only one of the three Gospels which tells us about the anger of the Lord in this incident of the healing of the man with the withered hand. It's important for us to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ at times showed this emotion. He showed this passion because we live in a day and age where when people talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, even in Christian circles, this is never someone that's upset over wrong. This is someone that's always, hey, everything's okay, lovey-dovey, and God is love, but he's also holy. And the Bible here speaks of his anger, and he looked round about on these evil men. Uh, we owe that to Mark, because the other gospel writers don't give it to us. And so Mark tells us about his anger. Look at the cause of the anger. According to verse number 5, the cause of the anger was the hardness of their hearts. The hardness of their hearts. Would we be naive to think that Christ is not angry at hard hearts today? Hard hearts. This is a serious problem. Serious problem. And Jesus was upset at the religious leaders of his day because they had hard hearts. They had a heart problem. They had a spiritual problem. They had a moral deficiency. And they were insensitive to the right ways of God. They were also insensitive to the needs of man. Insensitive to the ways of God and insensitive to the needs of man. In other words, they had no compassion for the needy. Here was a man that had a withered hand, and they were more concerned about the day of the week than they were about that man finding relief. Jesus was angry. He was angry. Remember, this is the same Lord that overthrew the, the tables twice. In the temple, Jesus was angry. The man with the withered hand could just keep on suffering, according to the Pharisees. Keep on suffering. Why? It's the Sabbath. We don't care about you and your suffering. It's the Sabbath. What does sin do? It hardens the heart. That hasn't changed. Sin will harden your heart to the point where you, you're no more sensitive to the, the, the preaching of God's word. You're no more sensitive. We, get, we can get so callous. Sin makes us into cruel people. That's why we've got to stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a cruel world. It can rub off on us very easily. Very easily we start to mimic the attitude of, uh, of our environment and we we, we view this world as cruel, and, and it is. And before we know it, we're acting cruel too. Shame on us. We don't have the compassion of our Lord. The Pharisees were more concerned about the day of the week. We need to keep our heart tender. People all around us with needs. You're not too busy to show some compassion. We also need to keep our heart tender by staying in God's paths and not veering to the left or to the right. We also need to keep our heart tender by being faithful in our Bible reading and in our prayer time. Because if your heart isn't tender with encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis, your behavior will become sinful and your judgment will be severe trying to save you from that, as well as myself. 
And so, let's keep our heart tender. What was Jesus so angry about? They had hard hearts. Hard hearts. Do you remember when Isaiah saw the vision in the temple, and the Bible says that the, the posts moved? Post actually moved at the presence of God. I often think of that passage. A post. These aren't living objects, inanimate objects. Posts that move and hearts that won't. But you better keep your heart tender and soft and pliable. And don't let this cruel, cruel, cruel world turn you into an image of itself. The character of the anger. Anger is often an indication that the person who is angry has lost control. They've flown off the handle. They, they, they have no uh, control over their passions. They've lost it. But there is a legitimate anger. Please learn that. And Christ shows us that in this passage. There is a lawful anger. There is a righteous indignation. There are times when you would be wrong to not be angry. The Bible teaches there is an anger which is justifiable. The Bible tells us this in several places. In Proverbs 25, 23, the Bible says, The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. The Bible tells us there what can help Stop a backbiting tongue. Somebody that just gets angry and says, you need to stop. I've seen that in my ministry. Somebody just backbiting. You've got to confront that. You've, you've got to confront it with, with some righteous indignation. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and sin not. In other words, there are times when if you're not angry, you're sinning against God. Be angry and in that way, don't be sinning. The key is making sure you're angry at the right thing. And when you're angry at something that makes God angry, then you've got the right type of anger. The wrath of God is a legitimate anger. It is an anger against that which is evil. It is an anger against that which God hates. It is someone that says, I love good so much that I must hate evil. And if I don't hate evil, then I'm showing how much I don't really love good. I'm not going to be on the fence. I can't have my cake and eat it too. Okay? Let those that love the Lord hate evil. We ought to fear the wrath of God. Like little else. <laughs> Imagine the hard-hearted sinner is going through life, they should be trembling. They should be on their face saying, what must I do to be saved? But one day this great day of wrath is going to come. Another support for the properness of Christ's anger are the, the words in the Bible that describe anger. In the Greek, there are three Greek words speaking of anger. There is thumos. This is a sudden outburst that cools quickly, okay? sudden outburst of anger, and then you're okay. There is orge, that is an abiding and settled habit of mind. It's not operative at all times, but when it's needed, it's there, and it's sustained until that need is over. Okay? It is the opposite of that first anger. And then there's paragisomus, which is Anger in the sense of exasperation. You're just fed up with something. You're exasperated. Uh, you're, 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 just, you're just, you've blown your, your top. That's the kind of anger, the unrighteous anger of man that is forbidden in Scripture. The Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. But that second anger, orge, is permitted and this is the one that Mark uses in our text. We need to be angry against evil. When I see two men walking down the street, lip-locking, holding hands, 
I get angry at that, and I ought to get angry at that. We ought to be angry at evil. One of the biggest problems which curses our society is God's people are no longer angry at sin. We're like that frog that is slowly cooked in the pot. And before we long know it, we just accept this sinful culture around us, and we've lost our righteous indignation. No, Jesus looked upon them with anger. And it's about time for some of God's people to exercise some of that righteous anger too. We are done with Sunday school. We've got 10 minutes before the morning service. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this miracle and all the truths we learn from it. I pray that we would go out from this class loving that which is good and hating that which is evil. In Jesus' name.